Welcome back to the Lutheran History Podcast. Uh, we're going to streamline this episode from the regular introduction and uh, some of the follow-up questions because we're doing a continuation of what was September's episode, uh, the second volume of Peter Prangy's Wielding the Sword of the Spirit series. This is volume two. There's volume three we haven't even touched yet, but we're focusing just on his second chapter, which was a pretty significant chapter. Uh, but it focuses on the formation of the Wisconsin Synod, and in light of the upcoming 175th anniversary of the Wisconsin Synod, I thought we would do a highlighted episode on this chapter, because it does touch on a lot of very uh, important, uh, fundamental, foundational, uh, and formational questions. So, Pastor Prangy, thank you once again for joining us on the Lutheran History Podcast. My pleasure. Always uh, a joy to be here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, for those looking for context, I would say listen to our previous episodes, but we're going to talk today about the Wisconsin Synod's formation and in the context of your book that's dealing with the topic of fellowship. So our first question for you is this, is the Wisconsin Synod officially formed in 1850, obviously didn't just appear out of midair, didn't form in a vacuum. Can you tell us about some of its uh, organizational parents? What organizations maybe had a had a role in, in forming the early years? Yeah, well, fundamentally, it was the German mission societies that were sending missionaries over to America at that time to serve Germans who had immigrated to Wisconsin, of course, other areas of uh, the United States at that time. So um, it was... Of course, Johannes Mühlhäuser, who is often considered the father of our synod, who came first, actually, to New York City and ended up in Rochester, New York, where he served as a pastor for, I think, more than 10 years. But then he began to hear some news of the need for pastoral work to be done in the Milwaukee area, where, of course, there were a lot of Germans that were settling. So in the 18, late 1840s, he made his way to Milwaukee and did find that uh, there was a great need for the type of work that uh, he had been called to do and began even recruiting some others to come and help him in the Milwaukee area. So it was finally in 1850 that three pastors and a couple other preachers, I guess, who were not officially ordained, they organized the Wisconsin Synod in May of 1850 at the Granville Congregation, which is northwest of Milwaukee. So Mühlhäuser had been a member of the New York Ministerium, but had also established relationships with other Lutherans out east, particularly those that were in the Pennsylvania Synod. So while the German mission societies were really a main source of manpower and money in those early days, the Pennsylvania Synod, in some respects, kind of was big brother or big sister to the Wisconsin Synod as well, and uh, would offer especially monetary gifts to the mission work that was being done in the Milwaukee area and Wisconsin in general at that time. So, and those those Lutherans in Pennsylvania, they had begun to have a bit more of a confessional stance by then. Um, they were moving in that direction. It was, in some respects, becoming a more Germanic synod by that time. Uh, Pennsylvania had become somewhat Americanized, um, but with German immigration as it was in those days, it it was moving also really in a more confessional, uh, on a more confessional trend. So it's kind of an interesting mix of uh, different parentage for the Wisconsin synod at that time and. So it would make sense that uh, they were not uh, necessarily to one end of the spectrum or the other as far as their Lutheranism went. Um, they were pretty squarely in the middle, I guess you would say, as far as their confessional stance. All right. Um, can you say a little bit more about the kind of European side of things, the mission societies? Because that, that's going to be a continuing theme throughout, I think, this session. Right. And the mission societies were uh, were organized in, uh, in Germany, of course. Uh, there were different centers for the schools and societies that were preparing young men to do missionary work in America. And at that time in Germany, it really had 
come down by government edict that they were trying to eliminate as much as possible the distinction between Lutheran and Reformed, especially that, uh, of course, the church was an evangelical church. They didn't want to fight about some of the some of the doctrinal issues that had so long divided uh, Christians in Germany, because uh, in one respect, they were looking to fend off the rationalism that was coming out of the Enlightenment. And so the Christians really felt like one of the difficulties that they were facing in winning people over was all of this doctrinal strife that was always so uh, prevalent. So one way to attract more people to actually being part of the church was by shaving off some of those rough doctrinal edges. And that uh, then really helped to establish also these mission societies where these both Lutheran and Reformed Christians were very interested in not only supporting the continued spiritual growth of Germans who had come to America and gone, of course, other places in the world as well, but they were also interested, of course, in evangelizing uh, Native Americans, for instance, or others who had never had an opportunity to uh, to hear the gospel. And again, they felt like the best way to do that was not by being too strictly confessional, but rather trying to um, be a, a little bit more um, easygoing when it comes to some of those doctrinal distinctions. So again, Wisconsin's roots were really these men who had, for the most part, been sent by these missionary societies. So again, it shouldn't be as any come as any great surprise that there was a degree of confessional uh, uh, wishy-washiness um, in terms of the early Wisconsin pastors. Yeah, and as we'll see a little bit later, some of those mission societies, probably the ones that came up a little more later, were a bit more confessional and that right. had its own influences as well. So it kind of depended on uh, when and also where uh, you came from. Right. So, no question. For, yeah, and, and for others who would like to dig deeper into this topic, and well, by just listening to a podcast, we have the the two episodes on the the German awakening. You might get a little context from that too, that ties in nicely with this. So, that being said, uh, what was the confessional state or the confessional status of the Wisconsin Senate at the start of the 1850s? Uh, people have kind of their, their myths, maybe, I might say, that they bring out, yeah. but what, what would you like to share? Well, officially and originally, when the Constitution was drawn up, they did pledge themselves, of course, to the canonical scriptures and to the unaltered Augsburg Confession and other Lutheran confessions. There's kind of a unique historical note, though, in Kaler's history of the Wisconsin Synod. If you look at the original Constitution, of course, it's still available in our archives today. He noted that in those places of the original handwritten constitution where the scriptures and the canonical script, uh, canon, or excuse me, the confessional writings were mentioned, that someone had gone in and scratched those, those terms out and uh, put in Bible Christianity or true Bible word instead. And uh, Kaler always suspected that it was Muehlheuser who may have done that. So, again, what it suggests is that even from its earliest beginnings, there was there was some confessional strife between the early members of the Wisconsin Synod. I suspect that um, it was John Weinman who had come to serve a congregation on the south side of Milwaukee, Oak Creek, who was the most confessional, it seems, of the three original pastors of the Wisconsin Synod. And he may have simply insisted that in drawing up the Constitution that it be drawn up that way. He served, uh, if my recollection serves correctly, I think he was the secretary, the first secretary. So probably would have been him writing down um, the Constitution himself. But Wyman left uh, in 1853. He received and accepted a call to Baltimore, Maryland. It seems as though he still considered himself a member of the Wisconsin Synod at that time, but with him no longer being uh, around geographically, uh, Muehlheuser may have at that point felt 
a little bit uh, more secure in taking his hand to the original constitution and making some alterations that were never approved officially at any of the conventions. And it does not seem necessarily that uh, those standards that were inserted there were ever officially utilized, but uh, it does, again, kind of indicate where the where those early pastors were, not necessarily all on the same page as far as what the standard for uh, for doctrinal purity should be. Yeah, that's a as, as far as Lutheran church history gets, this is a, as exciting as it is. <laughs> Again, you've right. got a, a confessional mystery. Who did it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Never, never quite got, got figured out. Um, and it's it's neat in your book, you do you have a picture of the archival document. Of course, right. it's a German, um, which right. everyone everyone should learn German anyway, but uh, you could read Well, it not just German, right but it's in that old German script, right. which is which is 10 times harder yet. Which I confess I still haven't mastered either, so right. <laughs> I don't want to be a hypocrite here. But anyway, yeah, that's that. That is a just taking a step back. That's an interesting story, but it, it has in, in that moment it was really significant. Of what's the identity? What's the practice of Wisconsin Synod? And when an institution is being founded, those early years that really sets the stage. The precedent for how things are going to be. So exactly right. It's an extremely significant. Um, what was written and what was crossed out. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's it's complicated. Was my short answer to that question? What was the confessional status of of Wisconsin? Exactly, um, and of yeah. course, what you often had, and it's just true, generally speaking, in the history of the church, and certainly in the history of the Lutheran Church as well, where you have this tension between the great desire to cling very tightly to what it is that you believe and confess on the basis of the scriptures, but also, on the other hand, being missionaries to people who are naturally not going to hold to or understand what it is that you believe. And so how can we be, on the one hand, strictly confessional, but also be inviting enough to people who do not hold to our confession so that we can bring them into the fold. And you're going to have mission-minded guys who are going to say, don't worry so much about all of those neat uh, neat distinctions or that minutia. And you'll have men on the other side, men and women on the other side, who will say, uh, no, uh, we have to have people signing on the bottom line um, and have this this idea of complete agreement. So there's there is always going to be that tension within with any within any body of Christians, and that's a it's a necessary tension. It's a good tension to have. Yeah, and I think the Mealweiser more often than not has been put in the I don't say the bad guy box, but you know he's kind of been put in a corner uh, in the historiography sometimes because of the confessional issue, which, you know, like we said, is significant, but perhaps the most charitable view of him would be he was highly prioritizing right uh, the mission side of, and you know just i think i mentioned it in my uh frank Kaler letter uh episode which is kind of dealing around the same things uh the lutheran church the gospel had never been preached or established in right. large parts of where we just take it for granted today and in, in wisconsin the midwest or large parts of america so i think his priority was let's get people to those locations and and, right. and share the gospel. Uh, I thought you were going to say the most charitable view of Mühlheuser was that he was extremely charitable. Uh, I mean, every yeah. every record you find about him, he was just a warm-hearted, uh, loving man who cared about human beings. And um, so, right, you can you can rightly criticize perhaps some of his doctrinal positions or his his approach to things. Um, but but he had a deep you know a deep pastoral heart for folks. He really was interested in sharing the the message of salvation with people. The I guess it was Mark Brown who's told this story. I, I don't know where he found it, but when the doctrinal discussions would start taking place at synodical conventions, that Mühlheuser would go outside and smoke a cigar because he wasn't necessarily well educated enough to even know what the guys were were arguing over. Um, so everybody has their different gifts and, and Mueller certainly had his as well. Yeah. And again, yeah, that the whole background in, in Europe, it's, 
we probably, we don't even mention that usually, but you know, his whole order background of I'm going to just share the Bible kind of right. mentality. And he found uh, probably a very similar strain of Christianity with the second great awakening here in America, kind of the Bible only uh, right. thing too. So uh, yeah, it was kind of out of his element if that story is true. Yeah. So uh, a lot of this is, you know, how confessional are you? Uh, how missional are you? Well, it, the practical application of it comes down in the, the fellowship arena often. That is the focus of your, your series. And it's still through this, this chapter is you take us through the history of the Wisconsin Synod's formation. Fellowship is the common theme you would see through it. So what were some of those early fellowship uh, practice challenges or new questions even that faced Wisconsin in its early years? Yeah, I'd say the main a uh, practical issue that these early pastors were facing was they were coming to a completely new, new, new land where these Germans themselves had just recently, um, you know, settled. And they were Christians. They were establishing, you might say, uh, congregations. I would, I would suspect that in many cases, it was kind of like, um, you know, the, the congregation that's depicted on Little House on the Prairie, where everybody just kind of joins the same church, and they have this kind of generic preacher that comes. And I suspect that in a lot of locations, that was the best that, that people could manage. They weren't going to establish an Episcopalian and a Presbyterian and a Lutheran and a cat. You know, it was... There just aren't enough people to establish all of these different denominational churches. We're going to have a church, and as long as you believe in Jesus, you're a member of this church. And the question became, of course, well, now what kind of preacher are we going to have? And in some cases, they may have had more than one option, but in a lot of cases, they probably uh, were scrambling to find even one option. At that time, there were German Methodists who were roaming the area um, who were the bane not only of the Wisconsin Synod pastors, but certainly the Missourians that had come to Wisconsin as well. Um, they they all were in agreement about one thing. They did not like German Methodists or German Methodist preachers who tended to be, uh, you know, kind of enthusiastic, probably would rile people up. but. Uh, the early men who came to serve in the Wisconsin Synod and joined the Wisconsin Synod, many of them had really no hesitation whatsoever of serving a congregation that had people who had both Lutheran and Reformed background. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in order to, to have enough people in a congregation to support the work of a pastor— how strict can you be in terms of cleaning up what it is that people believe or uh, even, you know, think of it from our perspective where who do you have on your congregational roster? Who do you say is a member or not a member? And uh, it just seemed like these men were, for the most part, pretty hesitant to be too quick to, to say to someone who might have a Reformed background, well, you're not allowed to be a member here because of what it is that you believe about the Lord's Supper or baptism or whatever it might be. In a lot of ways, it was kind of a, a German nationalism too, of course, where what what uh, the thing that they had in common was not necessarily complete unity in doctrine, but they did have a unity in language, of culture. Um, they They understood one another that way. So, again, it kind of led to this confessional mix in those early years of, of the Wisconsin Synod, and it, it forced pastors into making some kind of tough decisions in terms of who they were going to serve with the gospel and how they were going to do it. For the most part, it seems like the practice was We'll allow these people with kind of reformed background and confession to be members of our church, be active members of our church. We won't even take any discipline against what it is that they're believing. 
as long as they don't make a stink about uh, hearing Lutheran sermons and having Lutheran practice. There was at least one Wisconsin Synod pastor who essentially had two congregations uh, being served at the same building where he he would have maybe the 8 o'clock Lutheran service and then the 1030 Reform service, <laughs> and he would serve communion according to the Lutheran pattern at the 8 o'clock and according to the way the Reformed would like it at the 1030. And, and that was pretty early on. Mm-hmm. And that was a bridge too far for the vast majority of of the early Wisconsin Synod pastors. Yeah. Uh, likewise, in the, the Frank Keller letters, uh, at least the members, uh, both men and women, wrote how they didn't like Pastor Dulitz or, or Dulitz. He appears in your book as well, mm-hmm. because he specifically targeted Reformed doctrine. And said, oh, don't, don't poke the bear, kind of was the right a, a attitude of, you know, we're still figuring this out and don't antagonize. People, right, but and it might not be universally true, um, but I I get the sneaky suspicion that the reformed Germans, for whatever reason, may have been a a bit wealthier than the Lutheran Germans. So there was a kind of an economic concern as well that if mm-hmm. we take action against these reformed members, are we going to be able to afford running this church any longer? So. Let's let's keep them uh, around, keep them as happy as possible. And to um, to go to one specific uh, situation that I know a little bit more about, in Manitowoc, when Philip Kaler went to Manitowoc in 1858, he found a congregation there, First German Manitowoc, still a member of our synod, that had both Lutheran and Reformed members in it. In fact, he talks about uh, one of the most prominent members uh, who supported the church economically and who knew, he says, he knew Lutheran doctrine better than I did. Um, Kaler did not go in there and just clean house immediately. It was, it seemed like several years before these reformed members just decided maybe it's better to start our own congregation because, well, we don't dislike this pastor personally. It's clear that he's going to hold to Lutheran doctrine and practice, and it would just be smarter for us to go a different direction. So, even a even a guy as as confessional as Kaler wasn't going to go in and just simply sweep sweep the house clean, and uh, and you know take disciplinary action in in situations like that. Yeah, and I I probably exist here to this day because of that. I had some. Uh, they're from Lippa Detmold in, in Germany, and they were reformed in Manitowoc, and they became Wells Lutherans eventually. Uh, mm-hmm. That was under Philip Keller, though. Um, so if he had clean, cleaned them out right away in the 1850s, I, they married other other Wells families. I may not right. be here today, or at least part of me would be different. Exactly. I don't know how that how that what if how that works, but you know, right? Um, yeah. It can, so it does make a difference personal. how you approach these yeah. things. Yeah. Very interesting uh, connection. Uh, there, how that all tie, ties in. So that's that's the situation on, on the ground uh, in the 1850s. And like you said, it's different location by, by location. But it is interesting how all the way south, you know, the Frank Kalers in the Milwaukee area, all the way up north to, to Manitowoc. For those of you outside Wisconsin, it probably seems like right. that's micro, <laughs> microscopic differences. But, it's, you know, as far as the early wells is concerned, that's a pretty wide geographic spread for those early years. That was a pretty common uh, feature of that, that history. So now that's the, the fellowship and, and the practice, but you mentioned Kaler was a pretty, uh, Philip Kaler, the, the elder, he was a pretty confessional guy too. So can you describe how that battle for a purely Lutheran confession and practice was also waged at the same time as that, that missional outlook was, was in practice too? Yeah, and of course, one of the things that uh, that you really have to consider as you consider that this history is how tightly knit together were these congregations and pastors. Um, as the Wisconsin Synod was developing, of course, um, and and growing more geographically, uh, it in a lot of ways it comes down to a matter of doctrinal oversight that's being exercised by the leaders of the synod. Uh, 
uh, versus, you know, how, how much was it just pretty much that the pastor was the sheriff um, in his congregation as far as doctrine and practice goes, and no one was necessarily looking over his shoulder all that regularly to see whether or not he was towing the synodical line. Um, in in many respects, these, especially the Wisconsin Synod, these early synodical bodies, while they formed for the purpose of establishing uh, worker training together, doing mission work together, eventually doing publication together, it it took some time before they got to the the doctrinal oversight that um, was was is really necessary in order for there to be a a unity of of doctrine and practice so rather than uh, there being you might say some type of synodical sheriff who is kind of the the representative of the party line when it comes to to synod doctrine and practice in some respects we have that now of course with our conference of presidents in those days it was you might say more conversational um, as these as these members, these pastoral members of the synod were were fighting for uh, their perspective in terms of how doctrine should be practiced within within the synod. And again, it came down to essentially, you might say three sides where you had those like Kaler, um, Bodding, and others who were really asserting the necessity of establishing a much stronger confessional stance officially. Um, historically, in our church body, we talk about the Northwestern Conference. A lot of things are Northwestern. There used to be Northwestern College. Of course, we still have Northwestern Publishing House. Um, Northwestern Conference was viewed early on as kind of the stalwart confessional conference in the early Wisconsin Synod. But of course, there are the old timers, guys like uh, Mulehäuser. There was a pastor named Carl uh, Goldamer who was first in Manitowoc, ended up in Burlington. I think he went elsewhere as well. Kind of the old guard who were much, uh, much more mission minded, not so confessional minded. And then I think there was probably a pretty large middle ground of uh, of guys who just wanted to be Lutheran pastors and weren't necessarily um, so concerned about the arguments being made on either side. So there was just a period, the, really the first 10 years, where there was kind of a tug of war in terms of just exactly where are we going to land in terms of our synodical doctrine and practice. And uh, with the change of leadership, from uh, from Muehlheiser being the first president to Bodding being being elected in 1860, there began to be, you might say, some more official movement toward a more confessional stance of the synod. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, good summary and an overview. I think so. I, I think maybe now we can talk about some of the Wells historiography and the. Perceptions, right. not that this is going to affect uh, most of our, our listeners, but there's there's a large chunk that maybe have been, you know, getting the uh, the certain uh, historian's view uh, on things. And one of the, the historians that you bring up is uh, Edward Frederick. He wrote a, a kind of the, I don't know, would you call it the successor history to, to Kaler's history right. a little uh, several decades ago? And uh, you you analyzed the, the, that history. So, what were some of his main arguments and conclusions about the early Wisconsin? How did he view it how, and summarize it? Yeah, Ed how, Frederick. Yeah, Ed Frederick taught yeah. at our seminary. I don't know how long, probably at least thirty years. Um, and uh, of course, he taught during the generation of the baby boomers going through our seminary. So, a, a rather significant percentage of our pastors had Ed Frederick for for history and of course he was considered really the the point man as far as historical work in in the Wisconsin Synod at that time and 50 years ago uh, 1975 there were a series of articles that were published in the seminary's journal the Wisconsin Lutheran Quarterly 
that uh, dealt with each of the synodical presidents, the early synodical presidents. And Ed Frederick wrote uh, one on Johannes Bodding. And in the introduction of that essay, he made the point, of course, that so much of our synodical history has been painted or colored by J.P. Kaler's uh, work in the early history of the Wisconsin Synod. There's a mammoth volume that was ultimately published by the Protestant Conference, the first edition in 1970, where uh, Kaler's history covering the years, really the first 50 years, but um, probably most of the first 75 years in great, great detail. Frederick, Frederick took some uh, or had some objection to uh, to what he read in in Kaler's history. He um, he felt as though Kaler gave short shrift to Bodding uh, in terms of the movement from a less confessional to a more confessional stance by the synod. He chalked that up to Kaler's low view of administrators. And uh, he, he he believed that Kaler didn't like presidents, and um, that he was always leading toward the the professors, the the teachers. So, um, but in my reading of Kaler's history, first of all, I I find him not at all uh, debating whether or not Bodding had uh, a part to play in the rising confessionalism within the Wisconsin Synod. If anything. He credits Bodding with the type of personality uh, who was able to win people over to a more confessional stance. He talks about his own father being, in some respects, the conscience of the synod, where Philip Kaler, his dad, was kind of uh, the the hornet in in the synod's bonnet, you might say. He was a bit of a gadfly, where he was constantly bringing up this this question of confessionalism. And in some respects, Kaler is critical of his own father in saying uh, he you can't argue with the position that he had, but he perhaps didn't go about it the best way in terms of winning people to his side, and that he really needed a guy like Bodding, who was uh, just more diplomatic to be able to win people to this perspective. But as a consequence of Frederick's writing, I'm convinced the story has changed almost completely where now with a new generation of Wells history, whenever there's this discussion about the early history of the Wisconsin Synod and how it came to be more confessional, it's Bodding and Haneke who are given the lion's share of the credit for this what frederick termed a turn to the right as if they were going one direction and suddenly turned the opposite direction 180 degrees and when you dig into the original documents and kaler makes this same point there was always this underlying uh confessionalism within the Wisconsin Synod, really dating back, you might say, to to Weinman, who was one of the original three. So it was always there, um, latent under the surface, and that it just took time to kind of sort this all out. And if it wasn't for uh, a guy like Philip Kaler constantly bringing up this question, it may have gone an entirely different direction. And what's interesting is in some respects, when you read the early history, even even after Bodding became president, both Bodding and Haneke, to some degree, kind of fought against the brand of confessionalism that Kaler was fighting for, only to come around to Kaler's point of view uh, five years later, you might say, and really adopting uh, the same message that he had been preaching for more than a decade. So it's there. It's not wrong to say uh, that, or I, I wouldn't say that that Frederick's position is wrong. I'd just say the the nuance that that he developed in that 1975 essay and has been picked up by the generations to follow. It's just not it's not entirely correct.
yeah, and some as part of just critical thinking and, and just deep scholarship uh, is sometimes deciding between the the both and conclusion or the either or. Right. And maybe I, I haven't read that essay, but sometimes the the takeaway from from those who hear it and as it gets uh, remembered later, they, they they lose the both and and they just well it's one or the other and it must have been in right. this case botting right uh, and. All, that almost turns real history into a myth then, you know, where exactly. you, you get it oversimplified, uh, which is exactly. always, always a challenge with any well, and, and it goes, And it goes back to uh, a, one criticism that's been expressed about the second volume, and that is there's there's too much information here. And my argument to why I didn't summarize some of this history was because you can't summarize it. If you're going to get the real history, you do have to get into the entire story. Because when you do summarize history um, to a series of five or six bullet points, uh, it's inevitable that you're going to take it in a direction that's not entirely accurate or true. And so I think uh, it's just so critically important course for us to dig back into those original sources and uh, to find out what was really going on here how did this all really fall into place and when you do that critical work what you often find is that the way that story has been told um, especially by later generations isn't always entirely accurate yeah because everyone has to make a judgment about well what do you cut out and what do you continue to exactly say? And that really is a, exactly. a trickle down effect for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I don't know what, what we want to say to uh, to people involved and connected with the Wisconsin Senate as we approach the 175th anniversary. What what should be kept in mind by those planning it, by those hoping to participate and celebrate it? Um, I don't know if there's a, a simple conclusion to it other than. Uh, be wary of quick bullet point <laughs> summaries, right. perhaps. I don't know if what, right. what you would say to that. But. Well, I would just say to to give our early fathers perhaps more credit than more recent historians have granted them. I mean, again, when you get the kind of sh short summary of Wisconsin Synod history, the premise always is our early forefathers weren't actually very good Lutherans. Um, but in time, Bodding and Haneke showed up, and and then we became the strong Lutheran church body. And Kaler really argued that um, those we should we just shouldn't be so critical of those early men. They were they were in a very unique situation, and it's easy to judge them twenty twenty hindsight. But they might say back to us, "Why don't you walk a mile in my shoes first? And then come talk to me as to whether I did it the right way or the wrong way. Um, so I think just certainly to to honor their their work and of course the sacrifices that they made. It's it's easy for us pastors today I often make this point. You know we drive around in our air conditioned cars. Um, when you read the the history of those early men, you say I don't know that I'd be up to doing what they did. And um, so we're, we got to be thankful for the work they did as well. Yeah, good point. Well, I think I've heard several times now a myth uh, that has almost eclipsed the, 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 the botting <laughs> myth as it, it's formed. It's that along those lines, well, Wisconsin wasn't uh, confessional at all. And now the, the new one that I've heard recently is until CFW Walter fixed it, which right. is kind of mind-boggling how that would even be possible, but uh, you do get into the role that Missouri did play, and there is something to be said on that, and, and you do in, in great detail. Right. Um, so could you narrate and summarize, I know summarizing is sometimes dangerous, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, you, can you just tell for us, um, in your perspective, based on your research, what was the Missouri Synod's role in Wisconsin Synod's formation in those early years? Yeah, I would say the the Missouri Synod's role and Walther's role in particular in terms of the movement toward a more confessional stance that that eventually developed in the Wisconsin Synod 
It was not unlike the influence that Missouri and Walther had on many Lutherans in America in those days. One of the great advantages that uh, the Missourians had and Walther, of course, as as editor had, was their power of, of publication. They were uh, sending out their Luther honor already before the formation of the Missouri Synod started 1844. And in 1855, they started the publication of Lero and Vera, um, the the um, um, more theological journal of of the Missouri Synod. And through their writing, uh, and particularly Walther's writing in those in those uh, two journals, they had a a profound indirect influence on on so many Lutherans, and I think raised a lot of frankly, doctrinal and practical questions in the hearts of of pastors and congregations that, frankly, they had just never considered before. They didn't have the training necessarily to even know that maybe what they were teaching and preaching and practicing wasn't necessarily good Lutheranism, only to find out from, uh, from Walther's publications that maybe they had a thing or two to learn. So, it had a very positive impact that way. And of course, the advantage that uh, Walther and the Missourians also had in terms of influencing folks is that Missouri was wildly successful in gathering these uh, large congregations throughout the entirety of the the United States as it was as it was settled at that time. So, for on the one hand, the Missourians to be so strictly confessional, but also on the other hand, to be so wildly successful, uh, the rest of the Lutherans in America had to scratch their heads and say, maybe these guys are onto something. If if we want to grow, we have to take a approach similar to theirs. In fact, that's what uh, August Pieper tells us in in one of his articles about the history of the early Wisconsin Synod. That when these that the, when these early missionaries that were sent to the Wisconsin Synod first came over to America, and they'd stop off out out east somewhere, they were being told by the eastern pastors that when you get to Wisconsin, your your best opportunity for growth might be to be more confessionally Lutheran as opposed to having a you know, a, a wider confessional perspective on things, because that's what people are are interested in. So, you might say there was there was a bit of a of a a mission strategy to being more like Missouri, thinking that this was the way you were going to grow your congregation. So indirectly, that way certainly there was influence, and also I'd say on the other hand, indirectly that especially when the Wisconsin churches, the Wisconsin Synod churches in the Milwaukee Watertown area began to serve disaffected Missourians who either had been excommunicated by their Missouri congregation, whether rightly or wrongly, or didn't like the pastor that was now sent to their congregation and they had a break-off congregation, they... um they would often go to the neighboring Wisconsin Synod pastor and he'd take them into membership, start serving them or their break-off group. And of course, that put the Wisconsin Synod on Walther's and the Missouri radar. And and that's when uh, those guys started to be the victims of some pretty sharp criticism in those same volumes. And um, of course, the Missourians early on were very, very suspicious of the Wisconsin Synod's confessional stance because they were receiving their pastors and money from these German Union missionary societies. They heard rumors about um, how some of these Wisconsin Synod pastors were serving both Lutheran and Reformed members in their congregations. And it was just kind of uh, easy targets to um, to shoot at. and. Um, you know, some of it was was undoubtedly true, but the the picture was painted in such a way that that was not entirely accurate. And the early Wisconsin Synod men, including uh, Philip Kaler, 
who was strongly confessional, they really, in many respects, resented the way that they were um, being handled by Walther and, and Missouri in their publications. So in some respects, you might say they had this effect where the Wisconsin men kind of took an attitude of, we'll show you just how confessional we are. And uh, eventually, of course, it came around to them establishing fellowship with one another. Yeah, well, I think perhaps for the sake of time, we um, maybe should just continue with how they did uh, establish fellowship with one another, how that progressed. In your book, you have a, a good section on uh, Philip Kaler's Matter of Conscience and the Iowa Synod and, and how that formed things. And you could touch on those two if it's, it's part of uh, this the story as well. But how were these? rough spots. I mean, it was pretty hostile, honestly, <laughs> at, the, at the low point. Um, right. How were they smoothed out by the end of the 1860s? You know, um, sometimes as uh, pastors or people, we say, I wish I had a magic wand to just take all of these things away. It almost seemed as if someone must have used a little bit of a magic wand when it came to the fellowship that was established between the Wisconsin and Missouri Synod, because even as late as March, April, 1868, Missouri was still shooting bullets at the Wisconsin Synod for its doctrine and practice. But within four, four or five months, they were in fellowship with one another. Um, and they had declared one another as Orthodox church bodies. And, um, you know, how, how did it actually happen? There were not uh, many, many years of doctrinal discussions where they wrote out long documents and made sure that uh, everybody was on exactly the same page on on every jot and tittle, and then you sign this document in blood at the end of the day. There was basically an afternoon, it seems, of discussion between the five probably most confessional uh, pastors in the Wisconsin Synod at that time, and a handful of Missourians, including Walther, where they they the 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 basis of their discussion was a set of theses that Walther had written on the matter of open questions, which were uh, doctrinal questions that um, the Missourians believed were completely settled on the basis of Scripture and the Lutheran confessions. The Iowa Synod was allowing for a greater latitude in terms of just what it is that you believe, for instance, on the thousand year and the idea of a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, for instance. And um, once Walther was convinced that Wisconsin was on the same page as him uh, and the Missourians in terms of their approach to the scripture and the confessions, they weren't going to go through every detail of doctrine to make sure that um, you know there was some notion of complete agreement. They were satisfied when they saw that attitude. And as part of the agreement, um, one of the things that each of the church bodies promised was that they would exercise doctrinal discipline within within their churches because they they readily recognized that it's one thing for this group of 10 guys to get together and see that they're all on the same page, basically, as far as doctrine and practice. It's quite another thing to get every pastor in both church bodies to um, sign on the bottom line in terms of how they're going to uh, preach and teach and practice doctrine, and that it's necessary always for church bodies to be exercising doctrinal discipline. So with those assurances in uh, in October of 1868, they were able to not only establish that they were in church fellowship with one another, but pretty quickly um, begin to do worker training work together as the Missourians would send uh, their college-age men to Watertown to, uh, to do pastoral training there, and the Wisconsin guys would be sent to St. Louis to be trained to be finished off in their pastoral training at Concordia Seminary St. Louis. So it was there were some practical gains that were were found as a result as well. Yeah, and that 
takes us into you know the the episode that we had done previously on the formation of the synodical conference. So I think that right. that tie, ties in nicely. Uh, anything else that you might want to say about the the formation of the Wisconsin Synod? We covered about the first twenty years uh, or so. Yeah, um, just maybe the other thing that that happened in about the same time as Missouri Wisconsin came together. There was a time where um, Wisconsin was, became a member of the General Council out east. And also, you might say, kind of played footsie with the Iowa Synod, who were arch rivals of Missourians uh, during those times. So Wisconsin was, you might say, looking for kind of best church partners during during those days. And um, they were razor close, it would seem, to have to having established some fellowship with the Iowa Synod, there were certainly men in Wisconsin who were much more Iowa leaning. Of course, they did become members of the general council for a year or two, uh, but left pretty quickly. So again, it just, it demonstrates that these same men who were members of the same church body, they were, they were working this all out and um, for them to eventually land with the Missourians and in the Synodical Conference, of course, was a great blessing, but also had some some profound practical implications for the the future of the Synod as well. So it's just it's a it's a very important part of our history and essential to understanding, um, so that you can understand why we ended up where we ended up. Yeah. Well, very good. So uh, typical episodes, I might ask uh, a guest if uh, they're doing an upcoming project or uh, what they would like to see more history, uh, Lutheran history done uh, by other scholars if they're not up to it. But since this is kind of a anniversary themed episode, if uh, time, money, uh, talent was no no limit, what would you really like to see for 175th? celebration of the Wisconsin Senate. I'm just curious if you have any ideas. Well, there are all these original documents that sit in the archives um, that are written in, in original German script. We're thankful that the earliest of the presidential papers have been transcribed and translated by, by um, some of our sainted professors from a couple generations ago. So that that's just a great boon to have those available. But there are, there are plenty of documents that sit there that uh, remain untranscribed and untranslated. I've actually found a lady in Buffalo, New York, um, who who is willing to take commissions on transcribing and translating stuff. And she's... Uh, She's pretty economical compared to others that I have found. So I'm doing some family history where she's uh, doing that work for me. But I would love for us, if it uh, if if we had uh, unlimited resources, to um, to hire some folks to make that to unlock that history. Because of course, when it is in that old German script, or if you don't know German, there there's so much valuable history that just remains under that rock. Uh, so to to get more of that kind of work done for for the future generations, I think would be a really good project to have. Yeah, sounds good to me. That, that was a, a true historian's answer. <laughs> for, yeah, for a historic anniversary. So, well, maybe a true historian would learn to do it himself. Well, but, yeah. um, I'm too old <laughs> to learn that stuff. Yeah, uh, we all have different gifts too. I think right. it's, it's part of it. We can't all do everything. So. All right. Well, this was, uh, again, as usual, very uh, enjoyable time for me to have this conversation with you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Premi, for joining us once again on the Lutheran History Podcast. My pleasure.